Hey, I wanted to quickly review some of the stuff from uh, the 17th when we talked about Tourette's syndrome and histamine. Um, so first of all, we reviewed in particular the um, uh, cortex and striatum and the different pathways there and the role of dopamine, the two different dopamine receptors there, and then summarized the main pathways for dopamine um, signaling in general. Um, the, uh, um, for Tourette syndrome, we're mostly interested in the, the role of dopamine in motor movements in the striatum, substantial nigra to striatum. Um, we talked about the different receptors and what's going to happen with agonists and antagonists of each, both in terms of excita excitation and inhibition of the cells, which cells they're on, and the ultimate consequences for the motor cortex. Um, overall, the ultimate consequence of increased dopamine is an increased desire to move. Um, and then sort of briefly talked about Parkinson's disease, um, and in Parkinson's disease what happens is there's less dopamine produced in the substantial nigra, actually a lot of the dopamine producing cells die, and as a result there's decreased ability to move. Um, we're not going to go more into the detail of Parkinson's disease beyond that, um, uh, but if you take systems neuroscience then you get into a lot more of the detailed neural circuitry of that projection and what goes on. Um, we then talked in general about um, Gen about genetics and what genes are and what alleles are. Those are both technical terms that you should review. Um, genes are just um, you know places where you find instructions, um, and then allele is a particular set of instructions that you might find on a particular individual's chromosomes um, that um, may create uh, either sort of have the normal common version of a gene, so that makes a certain normal protein um, that matches what most people have, um, or rare, which can be anything from, you know, less than half the population down to like, you know, only a few individuals might have a particular mutation. And these kinds of mutations can make sometimes overactive, sometimes inactive, sometimes less active, sometimes add completely new functions to what goes on. Um, in particular, with Tourette's and with all of the diseases that we're talking about, well, with 99% of the people with Tourette's and with every other disease that we're talking about this semester, um, except for one situation with Alzheimer's as well, um, there's a what we call a complex genetic basis for the disease. What that means is that there are dozens or even tens, you know, 50 different genes that have been associated with Tourette's syndrome um, and many different mutations that can either increase or decrease your risk. Um, for 99% of people with Tourette's, setting aside that sort of like one exception, um, there is not a genetic guarantee. All the genes do is sort of change your risk. Maybe you make it more likely, maybe a little less likely that you might develop Tourette's syndrome. Um, the, um, so that, what that means is you can have two people with the exact same genetic profile. Some people have Tourette's, one has Tourette's, one doesn't. Identical twins. Um, might be, you know, one person with Tourette's, one person with that. So the genetics just changes the chance. In general, 1% of the population has Tourette's. Um, some people have no genetic risk factors but still end up with Tourette's syndrome. Some people have a lot of genetic risk factors and don't get Tourette's syndrome. Um, and so um, the genes really just play with those probabilities but don't give a guarantee. Tourette's is interesting because there is 1% of people with Tourette's that do have a particular mutation that does guarantee this. That's a mutation that um, means that one of the histidine decarboxylase genes, um, one of the genes that converts histi uh, that makes the enzyme that converts histidine to histamine, is broken. What that means is that the person produces half as much histamine. What goes on with that? Well, there's a few things that go on with that. Um, so there's less histamine being produced. Histamine um, is produced in this area called the tuber mammillary nucleus, and then axons go all over the place, um, including keeping you awake. That's why Benadryl, a histamine, an H1 histamine receptor antagonist, um, will make you sleepy. And in the basal ganglia, there are H2 receptors. Um, with Tourette syndrome, we're really interested in what happens with histamine in the basal ganglia. So here, this is this sort of weird synapse where instead of um, histamine axons making synapses onto dendrites or cell bodies, the histamine axons make synapses onto the presynaptic terminals of dopamine-releasing cells. And there, histamine binds to H2 receptors, which then inhibit voltage-activated calcium channels, and therefore mean less dopamine is released. So histamine, in everybody's brain, is being released in the basal ganglia, and it is decreasing the release of dopamine. It's part of how your brain regulates whether dopamine is released, and ultimately regulates whether you move or not. 
it slows down and prevents inappropriate or undesirable urges to move. Now, um, in brains where there's less histamine, that means there's less recept there's there's less suppression of dopamine, so more dopamine to so increase urges to move. That's the first level of understanding with this. But then that actually raises a question about what is going on? Why, wait a minute, why don't people with this mutation fall asleep all the time? Why don't they have narcolepsy? Um, and the reason has to do with something called the affinity of the receptors. So the H1 receptors have a very high affinity. They're the Beyonce receptors. They have, they really, histamine sticks really well. And so if we cut in half the amount of histamine released out of those vesicles, the H1 receptors still are completely activated. 10,000, 20,000 molecules, it doesn't matter. All the H1 receptors are active. But if we decrease the amount of histamine being released, then the H2 receptors are less active and, and less sticky. Um, and so as a result, if you cut in half the amount of histamine released, those receptors do notice that decrease and now are less activated by the decreased histamine because 10,000 molecules is not enough to completely saturate them. 20,000 molecules is, but 10,000 molecules isn't. And so if you decrease the amount of histamine produced, those H2 receptors notice that decrease. Um, uh, and so um, those are a few different concepts to sort of keep straight when you're thinking about Tourette syndrome and histamine in particular, and also just general concepts in terms of the way neurons communicate with each other.